we have initiated a foundation day lecture series and today we have the sixth lecture and we have our star speaker professor bernard comrie who is going to enlighten us on grammatical grouping and the subgrouping of, of great andamanese languages an exploration in historical linguistics professor comrie is not new to the linguists nevertheless i take this opportunity to say a few words about him he studied linguistics even before i was born so it's very very interesting to see that in 1977 he had his influential questionnaire which i used when i was a student so you can imagine he's in one sense the father figures for many of us here in linguistics the university of cambridge taught russian and linguistics for several years for at least 6 years of the university of southern california where he taught for two decades and in late 90s he moved to germany to take up a very important position in the world i must say the directorship of the department of linguistics at the max planck institute for evolutionary anthropology in leipzig that's the position from which he retired in 2015 but of course he has held several positions in since 2002 he has been distinguished professor of linguistics at the university of california santa barbara even now he he just retired from there all in retired retired from probably the university officially and he is now a full time residence at ucsb you who know professor uh, kamre knew that he has been uh, working on several uh, languages he has gone to different of the world for several decades for example papua new guinea the north caucasus and also our region in india the andaman islands and that's uh, the topic today he chose to speak with us in one of his uh, intros or uh, brief series he has been known to say i quote professor comrie if it's a language i will work on it it's a wonderful quote i simply love it that is why seeing this quote i was motivated to use my mother tongue in greeting this audience if it is a language to greet let it be my own so that's something i wanted to take from you he has worked on several areas his specializations of course typology his cross linguistic uh, typology has uh, impressed many and the wonderful topics he has worked are tense and aspect transitivity voice numeral systems writing systems and many more on um, languages and genes he has turned his attention to many other fields uh many of us have listened to him when he visited uh, new delhi especially the conference organized by professor k v subara when uh, that that was on anaphora many of us from cil met him there i was also one of those fortunate fortunate people who got acquainted uh, to professor comre since then for last 25 years uh, i know him and i was also associated with him in one of the volumes he edited the world atlas of language structures he is one of the editors as many of you know it's one of the most indispensable research and reference resource for all linguists across the world it's accessible online and professor comre has eight chapters to it since many of you are waiting to listen to him i don't want to talk about his contributions to walls but it's a wonderful piece of work people who want to get uh, any uh, some ideas please uh, look into that professor comre has several honors he is a member of uh, saxon academy of sciences in leipzig and uh, he is a foreign member of royal netherlands academy of arts and sciences honorary doctor of letters latrobe university australia uh, he has been awarded several uh, medals and uh, other uh, important uh, positions he has been awarded honorary doctors 
and uh, his publications of course are numerous time will not be enough to talk about it his memberships of editorial boards and professional associations are many many uh, he has more than 20 uh, professional associations and member of edit several editorial boards including many journals like uh, for example we have the mutan grammar library journal of south asian languages and linguistics journal of universal languages and so on and so forth he has been a visiting fellow across many countries and he has uh, chaired many phd committees across the world it's he has a very impressive bio data and we are indeed very fortunate to have someone like professor comrade with us today with these few words uh, from my side uh, i would like to welcome you on behalf of the central institute of indian languages and on behalf of the director cil on on all other people who have assembled here evening to you professor comrade and before you take over i request our director professor cg venkesh murthy to say a few words thank you professor uh, good good morning everybody thank you professor uma it is indeed an honor for the central institute of indian languages to have one of the leading figures in linguistic typology like professor comrade speak in our 53rd foundation day lecture series he has long associations with the institute and has visited us several times i was also very happy to know that one of his students from the urbana campaign in 1978 has served the cil as its director for almost a decade he is professor uday naran singh there are many many colleagues who have benef benefited from the scholarship of professor comrade his contributions to linguistics amazing and I'm particularly fascinated to know that Professor Kamri seeks collaborations with population genetists, archaeologists, anthropologists to combine the strength of these disciplines in solving problems relating to prehistoric human migrations. Fantastic. With these words, I welcome you once again and I'm eagerly waiting to listen to you as much as all others who are doing here, who have gathered here. Good morning and welcome once again, Professor Kamri. I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am now going to try and share my screen. So you should now see the first of my slides. Uh, please let me know if that is not the case, or if anything goes wrong while I am presenting with the presentation of the slides. Uh, the work we are that okay. Do... Okay, good. So the work that I will be uh, reporting on today is work that I have been carrying out together with uh, my colleague from Italy, Raul Zamponi, who is, I think, out there somewhere in the audience. Uh, although uh, one for him, surely be yeah. the middle of the night um, but at any rate we have been working together on the traditional languages of the andaman islands more specifically the languages of the great andamanese family and it's on some of the languages of this area that i will be speaking to you about today this map here shows the traditional area where the indigenous languages of Great Andaman were spoken at around the time of uh, contact with the British administration, so the second half of the 19th century. Um, one of the languages noted here, Jarawa, is actually not a Great Andamanese language, although it happens to be spoken in Great Andaman. But all of the other languages are members of the Great Andamanese family. And I will start off with an introduction to the languages of the Andaman Islands, especially the Great Andamanese uh, family. I will then turn to looking at some earlier work that Raoul and I did together, that uh, work in the direction of trying to figure out 
the subgrouping of the languages. And then in the third part, I will come to the uh, new material that I want to present to you today, which is looking at grammatical information uh, leading towards that goal. But first of all, just a little bit of background on the indigenous languages of the Andaman Islands. So there are actually two families, um, Great Andamanese, the one that I will be talking about, and Ongan. There are various uh, spelling variants, or so Angan with an initial A, and sometimes also called Little Andamanese. So Great Andamanese is a small language family, but perhaps uh, somewhere around six uh, distinct languages, uh, maybe a few more if you count uh, local varieties as well. Uh, Ongan is a very small language family, uh, two languages that we know of, and perhaps also the language of North Sentinel Island, about which we know, of course, virtually nothing. The unity of the great Andamanese family, so the fact that this is a single family, this was recognized already in the 19th century. In fact, even by people who were not professional linguists, but who were documenting the language. They also recognize that Great Andamanese is very different from Ongan. In fact, as far as we can tell, there is no demonstrable genealogical or genetic link uh, between the two language families. They are just two distinct language families that happen to be spoken as neighbors uh, in the same rather small area. The Angan family, the two languages that we know of, uh, Jarawa and Unge, are both uh, still spoken today by small populations. Um, like all sm small populations, they are, of course, endangered. Their languages are endangered, but the languages are still a vital means of communication in their communities. The situation with Great Andamanese is very different. None of the traditional varieties, so the varieties that were spoken uh, in the second half of the 19th century, the early 20th century, none of those varieties is still spoken. Though, as we will see, there are a few speakers, or perhaps more accurately, rememberers of uh, a latter-day variety of Great Andamanese, um, called present-day Great Andamanese, which has been the subject of recent scholarship by Anvita Abbey. And I'm going to concentrate on Great Andamanese. So essentially, I will just be talking about the Great Andamanese languages. Uh, these are the languages that Raoul and I have been working on. I will not be talking any more about the Ongan family. Now, in the older accounts and even very recent accounts of the languages of the Great Andamanese family, it is usual to recognize 10 traditional ethno-linguistic varieties. Though I should emphasize that for some of these varieties, some of them are very close to one another and would perhaps more accurately be describable as dialects of a single language rather than separate languages. So although there are 10 traditional ethno-linguistic varieties recognized, and each of these has been given a separate code in the ISO code, ethnologue, for instance, uh, also in uh, Glottolog, um, that may be something of an exaggeration in terms of the number of actual languages that were in the family. Going roughly from north to south through the archipelago, so through the three islands, three main islands that form uh, Great Andaman and some of the offshore islands as well. We have these 10 traditional varieties with the spellings and names that I will be using. Sometimes there are variations, but these are the forms that we prefer. So Akachari, Akakora, Akabo, Akajeru, Akakede, Okojuoi, Okol, Opuchikwar, Akarbale, and Akabea. You notice that many of them begin with uh, 
aka or oko or something similar. Uh, this is a prefix which uh, has the literal meaning of mouth. It's a body part prefix, but by extension, it can also refer to a language and by extension also to the uh, ethnic group that speaks that language. Now, for two of the varieties, two of the traditional varieties, Akakora and Akabo, we have minimal documentation, basically just a handful of lexical items and a few toponyms or a few place names. This documentation for these languages is so small that we cannot really do anything with that material other than just note that these lexical items were attested. In general, they are identical to lexical items, <coughs> excuse me, that are found in other neighboring languages like Akajeru, for instance. So I will not be including material from Akakora and Akabo simply because such material has not come down to us. At the opposite extreme, Akabea is the most extensively documented of the languages and a lot of our material comes from that language. So these are the 10 traditional ethnolinguistic varieties. In addition, there is one modern variety, present day Great Andamanese, which seems to take its uh, grammatical structure largely from Akajeru, so Akajeru, this language here, but also incorporates lexical items from other North Andamanese languages, so Akachari, probably also Akakora and Akabo. So this one modern variety um, has a small number of speakers, or perhaps we should say more accurately, a small number of rememberers, because the language has not been a regular means of communication for years, probably uh, for decades. Um, members of the community normally speak the local variety of Hindi with one another. Um, at the last count, there were three, only three remaining rememberers of present day Great Andamanese. So this is all that is left in terms of uh, speakers or semi-speakers, rememberers of the whole family, the Great Andamanese language family. Now for the traditional varieties, what kind of information do we have? Well, a fair amount of documentation was done in the late 19th century and the very early 20th century, in particular by three people. There are small amounts of uh, documentation by others, but these are the three people who really contributed most to our knowledge of the languages. So Edward Horace Mann and Morris uh, Vidal Portman were local administrators, and both of them, at least for part of the time that they were in the Andamans, were designated as officers in charge of the indigenous Andamanese population. So officers in charge of relations with those populations. Uh, Alfred Radcliffe Brown, uh, one of the founders of uh, the discipline of social anthropology, did his first field work in the Andaman Islands between 1906 and 1908. Um, as far as uh, we know, he never returned after that. Had a very distinguished career uh, in South Africa, Australia, and then back to uh, his home uh, country of uh, England. Um, and uh, produced a major work, the Andaman Islanders, which includes a fair amount of linguistic material, although his basic interest was clearly in social anthropology. For present day Great Andamanese, as I already mentioned, a lot of work has been done here by Anvita Abbey, and there are two works that I would uh, mention in particular, uh, relating to the documentation and analysis of present day Great Andamanese. These are Professor Abbey's dictionary of the Great Andamanese language. And uh, the year after that, she published a grammar 
of the great Andamanese language. So these are our main sources together with some of her other publications, some publications together with her colleagues. So these are um, our main sources uh, for the material that we will include from present day great Andamanese. For the analysis of the traditional varieties, so I mentioned the actual documentation was done by those three scholars, three administrators, scholars uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Most of that material then uh, laid almost untouched for a century. Uh, some occasional citations of uh, some of the lexical material, um, attempts often not very successful to make sense of the grammatical structure of the languages. But it was really only uh, in the early 21st century that work at the level of the present day linguistic and grammatical analysis started to be done on the traditional varieties of the great Andamanese languages. The work was started by Raul Zamponi, but he approached me early on to ask if I would be interested in joining the project. Um, I knew virtually nothing about the languages before that, but um, I have really enjoyed the uh, collaboration that has led to our work so far and which uh, I hope will continue to lead to more work in the future. But so far we have published a grammar of Akabea with the uh, Oxford University Press last year. So this is a grammar, uh, we're working at present on a dictionary, so we hope that the dictionary will be ready in the near future. We have a grammar of another language, actually a grammar plus dictionary of another language, Akajeru. This is a much smaller volume because the amount of material that was documented is much smaller. So this is in press with UCL Press, a university college London press. And I'm pleased to say that this will be an open access publication. So when it comes out uh, later on this year, we have already uh, finished the proofs and the index. So it should be coming out uh, very soon and that will be available open access. And then other work on the other languages, the other traditional languages, is in progress. So we're hoping to produce um, probably in some cases a grammar and a dictionary of a single language. Um, maybe in some cases it will make more sense to combine material from more than one language into a single volume. But this first part was just to give you an idea, some idea of what kind of material is available and what kind of work has been done so far on this material. In the second part of the talk, I want to get now more specifically into the subgrouping of Great Andamanese. And as a first step, we can be a little bit more specific about how many languages, how many groups of languages were recognized early on. So were known, uh, let's say even, maybe some of them maybe even in the 19th century, certainly in the 20th century. So it was recognized that the four northernmost varieties, Akachara, Akachari, Akakora, Akabo, Akajeru, form a single North Andamanese group. And we, so we here always means Raul and I, so we think that these four traditional varieties were probably dialects of a single language. Um, we base this not only on the similarities that we observe, um, but also on observations by the, those who are documenting the languages. So observations of the kind that uh, the Akajeru could understand, the Akabo could converse with the Akabo uh, without uh, any obvious difficulty. The present day language, present day Great Andamanese, as I think I already said, is based with some input, especially lexical input, from other North Andamanese varieties. There's then a single language, Akakede, and one of the topics I'll be talking about in more detail is precisely how this fits in with the other larger groupings. 
Then there are the Middle Andamanese languages, Okojuoi, Okol, and Opuchikwar. Uh, Opuchikwar and Okol were very close to one another and may well have been dialects of a single language or perhaps the extremes of a dialect continuum. And then the last of the groups, these groups, South Andamanese, including two clearly distinct languages, Akabale and Akabea. Now, there is one early or earlier um, attempt at the subgrouping of the Great Andamanese uh, languages. Um, this by the Indian scholar Esmanoharan uh, in the early 1980s. In his uh, presentation of the subgrouping, he does not really uh, provide evidence, provide linguistic evidence, and the basis of the subgrouping may have been more in terms of cultural affiliations of different groups, perhaps in part in terms of geography. But nonetheless, it is the first attempt at a subgrouping, and although we have some reservations about some parts, there are also other parts which turn out to be clearly correct. Two crucial aspects of Manoharan's uh, classification are the grouping of Akakede into Middle Andamanese. So we are going to suggest that that is probably wrong, in fact, almost certainly wrong. And second point, grouping North Andamanese and Middle Andamanese together versus South Andamanese, uh, where we have questions. So we're uh, certainly um, we feel this is a, an issue which deserves further discussion. Otherwise, there has been relatively little uh, explicit discussion of the subgrouping of the family until um, some of our own work. So first of all, a paper that we presented in 2017 or that we published in 2017 based on a conference, I think, uh, maybe a year or two years uh, earlier, a typological profile of the great Andamanese family. This was concerned more with the grammatical structure, but it did talk about the subgrouping of the different varieties. And we grouped Akakede together with North Andamanese, so not like Manoharan, who grouped it with Middle Andamanese. We grouped Akakede with North Andamanese to give a North Andamanese Akakede subgroup. And as we'll see when we go into some of the uh, more detailed material, uh, that seems to be correct. So later more detailed work has uh, reinforced that conclusion. We offered a different uh, grouping of the main group. So we grouped South and Middle Andamanese together versus North Andamanese Akakede. Recall that Manoharan grouped North Andamanese and Middle Andamanese together, as opposed to South Andamanese. But here, we have to admit that we were probably wrong. At the time, we had not done much work on Akachari. That's probably, of the documentation that has survived, um, that's probably the hardest to work with. It's mainly by Portman, and Portman seems to have known that language much less well than he knew the other languages. So uh, subsequent work on Akachari actually casts doubt on this claim. So um, you know, anyone in the early stages of a project like this is almost certain to make mistakes. And we admit quite freely that at this point we made a mistake. There are two main unresolved issues as well as a number of smaller issues but these are the two main ones that I want to address today. Does Akakede group with North Andamanese or with Middle Andamanese? So North Andamanese, remember the Comrie Zamponi hypothesis, Middle Andamanese, the Manoharan hypothesis. And the second question, does Middle Andamanese group more closely with North Andamanese or does it group more closely with South Andamanese, or clearly, or an alternative, another possibility would be with neither 
we just have three separate groups within this language family with none of them uh, being uh, with the middle andamanese not being particularly close to either north or south or occupying an intermediate position roughly equidistant between them now if we want to work out the subgrouping of a language family there is a gold standard so there is a method which has uh, become ac accepted over the last maybe 150 or even 200 uh, years of study of linguistics especially historical and comparative linguistics and that gold standard is the comparative method and in the comparative method what we try and do is we try and identify systematic shared innovations so if within a language family one group of languages shows a systematic shared innovation that is strong evidence that those languages form a subgroup i've given you an illustration here from uh, indo-european so four of what we now know as branches of uh, Indo-European, so Indo-Iranian, represented by Sanskrit, Hellenic, represented by Ancient Greek, Italic, represented by Latin, and Germanic, represented by Gothic, Icelandic, and English. And I've given two lexical items, there are many more that could be given, but these are two from the basic vocabulary that show the relevant pattern. I realize there are different ways of presenting uh, Sanskrit lexical items, different ways of uh, presenting the citation form. I've used one which is frequently used by Indo-Europeanists, um, but of course uh, with an audience uh, largely uh, from, from India, I will of course defer to uh, your preferences as to how these forms should be pronounced. So at any rate, we have the Sanskrit word for father beginning with a P, the ancient Greek word, the Latin word, they all begin with a P. But in Gothic, Icelandic, and English, we have initial F, systematically. Likewise, the word for foot, beginning with P in Sanskrit, ancient Greek, Latin, but with F in this uh, geographically very constrained group of languages in Northwestern Europe, uh, where the word for foot, as the English word foot, begins with an F. So we can state a generalization, Proto-Indo-European P, we can reconstruct the P to the proto-language, shifted to F, this is actually part of uh, what is called Grimm's Law, shifted to F in Gothic, Icelandic, English, uh, the ancestor of English, the ancestors of those languages, this is a systematic shared innovation. It therefore establishes Gothic, Icelandic, and English, plus a number of other languages, German, for instance, as a subgroup of the Indo-European family, one which is traditionally called Germanic. Now, that's the gold standard. That's what we would like to be able to do for Great Andamanese. Unfortunately, the present state of our analysis of the Great Andamanese material does not support this endeavor. We just do not have enough material from enough languages to be able to establish a network of, for instance, regular sound correspondences. In fact, it's not clear to us that the surviving material is in principle sufficiently rich to support this endeavor. So it may be that we will never be able to apply the comparative method strictly um, with a sufficient amount of material to great Andamanese material to work out using that gold standard to work out what the subgrouping should be. Therefore, we need to look at other methods which are necessarily somewhat less reliable. I mean, obviously, if one is the gold standard, then the others are going to be less reliable than that. 
but which can nonetheless throw some light on the relations among the languages of the family, which languages were closer to each other languages, which languages were further apart from other languages. Androla and I had a first attempt at this using lexical items. So this is what I will call, this is the second part of the talk, what I will call the lexical basis for subgrouping by identification of lookalikes. And you have there the reference to our publication from a couple of years ago, um, which uh, sets out in more detail uh, the, both the material that we used and the various procedures that we used. What I can do uh, today is just to give a summary of that methodology. So what was the methodology we used for our lexical comparison? Well, we established comparative word lists using the Swadesh 200 word list. So as you all probably know, this is, was a list devised by uh, Morris Swadesh, an American linguist, of 200 lexical items that are supposed to be basic vocabulary, will probably occur in all or nearly all, so we'll have lexicalization in all or nearly all of the uh, world's languages and can therefore be used in order to compare across languages. Swadesh made further claims about a regular rate of replacement through historical change and so on. We're not committed to those uh, further ramifications of his proposal, but the 200 word list does provide a good basis for lexical comparison should point out that although it's basically a lexical list, it does turn out that in the case of Great Andamanese languages, um, a couple of the equivalents are actually grammatical morphemes. So whereas in the Swadesh list, you might find a word like at, for instance, an English preposition, which in English is a separate word, it's equivalent in all of the Great Andamanese languages for which we have the relevant documentation is a bound grammatical morpheme, probably actually a clitic. But at any rate, we establish this comparative word list. Of course, we do not have all 200 words for all of the languages, um, but we have for, for many of the languages, uh, you know, around 150 words, um, occasionally going down maybe to around 80 words for some of the less well-documented languages. But uh, basically, we have enough material to carry out a comparison. We then look, so if we have a word like, let's say, the word for uh, good, then we can look at the lexical expressions for good across all the languages, see which ones look similar, which ones least alike, look completely different, um, and then establish a grouping in those terms. So, for instance, we might say, well, the word, from, the word for good in uh, Akachari and in uh, Akajeru and in present-day Great Andamanese, those really look very similar. I mean, sometimes we even find words that are identical across Great Andamanese languages. However, the word that we find in Akabea is completely different. So for this lexical item, we would put these into separate groups, separate lexical groups. And then once you've done that, once you've filled out the table, and I'll show you an example of such a table in a moment, in a minute, then what you do is for each pair of varieties, let's say we would take uh, Akachari and Akajeru, and we would also take Akachari and Akabea. So for each pair of varieties, you identify the number of lookalikes, so the number of lexical items where it looks like the forms might be related in the two languages. And you divide this by the total number of items for which data are available for both varieties. If that doesn't sound entirely clear as a kind of prose description, please don't worry, we will be looking at some examples in a couple of minutes.
But basically what this does is it provides us with a similarity index, so a percentage of uh, lexical similar, lexically similar pairs for each pair of languages. Now, in comparison with the gold standard, the comparative method, this does have a couple of obvious disadvantages. First of all, identifying lookalikes is subjective because we are not constrained, for instance, by regularity of sound change. The correspondences do not have to be regular. All that is required is that items should look sufficiently similar. So this is necessarily subjective. But the two investigators, Raul and I, found good intersubjective agreement. So we'd work, we worked separately in general. We came to the same conclusion. And in the few cases where that was not so, we were able to reach consensus. So we were able to agree on a position that we are willing now, both of us, to present to the outside world. So it is subjective, um, but as it turns out, good intersubjective agreement. The methodology is also less reliable because lookalike is not the same as cognate. Before, when we looked at those words in different Indo-European languages, for father and for foot, especially given the regularity of the sound correspondences, we can be reasonably sure that those are cognates going back to a single Proto-Indo-European form. But if we just have lookalikes, there might be other explanations for their similarity. For instance, one language might have borrowed the term from one of the other languages. So we would have to be aware of those other possible interpretations. That's one reason why the method we are using is not the gold standard. But also, since we do not have, we have not been able to establish regular sound correspondences, we cannot really distinguish lookalikes from cognates. So it's possible that some of the things we group together might involve borrowing, might involve lexical diffusion, but at the present state of our knowledge, we cannot guarantee that. Let's actually look at a couple of examples. So these are four examples from the comparative word list that we compiled in order to work out the lexical similarities, the degrees of lexical similarities between each pair of languages in the family. So there are four lexical items here, the noun hand, the noun bark, the sense here is the bark of a tree, so the uh, outside, the outermost part of a tree, uh, the verb to die, what in English is a preposition at, but which in all of the great Andamanese languages is uh, an enclitic, so a bound morpheme uh, that is attached enclitically, so at the end of a whole noun phrase, so not necessarily the head noun, but the whole noun phrase. So we're now going to ask whether the forms across the languages are similar or not. And since we're interested in lexical items, we actually concentrate on the lexical root. The word for hand, let's say the Akachari form, onkora, actually contains a prefix, ong, which is a body part prefix. Likewise, the word for bark of a tree contains a body part prefix, ot. Uh, the verb to die contains two prefixes that relate to such uh, features as valency, for instance. So we essentially disregard those uh, prefixes and concentrate on the root. In some cases, it would make very little difference, but in other cases, the prefixes might be quite different. So the ong prefix in the Akachari word for a hand versus the re prefix in the Okojuoi word for a hand. If we look at the root of the word for hand, kora, kora, koro, koro, kori, kari, kori, koro, koro, those all look very similar. So we put them all into a single lexical set. 
which we would label A. By contrast, the word for bark of a tree, kobo, kobo, kopo, yes, those look similar. No, but kaich is completely different. But kaich, 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 aij, kaich, those all look very similar. So here we have two different lexical sets. One set, roughly uh, kobo, which we put in as A, and that is found in Akachari, present day Great Andamanese, and Akakede. The other one, so Kaich, is found in Okojuoi, Okol, uh, Opuchiqua, Akabea, and Akarbale. Notice, incidentally, that in this case, the Akajeru word for bark of a tree is not attested. We simply don't know what it was. So there we just have a gap. Uh, we cannot do anything with that material. The verb to die, peel, 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 those all very similar, in fact, most of them identical. So we can consider those all to be A. But in South Andamanese, in Akabea and Akabale, we have a different root, li, so oko li in both languages, where oko is the prefix and li is the root. So those first uh, seven grouped together as A, the remaining two will group together as B. With the locative enclitic in the first set of languages, the first four languages, we have very similar forms. If the eel is identical, one of the allomorphs is identical across those four languages. Then a separate form, an, so this counts as B, and yet a third form, len, so this counts as C. So this, just to give you an idea of how we proceeded in coming up with the statistical data that I will present to you in a moment. So I want to emphasize the methodological uh, aspects of this project. So I don't want you just to go away with the conclusions, but also to bear in mind how we reached those conclusions. If you then look at all of those forms across all of the languages, you can develop a table like this. So if I look at Akachari and Akajea, Akajeru, for instance, these two languages, then they show 93% similarity. And if you want to go to the raw data, or the raw statistics, then that was actually 54 out of 58 lexical items that are attested in both languages. Um, if, however, you compare Akachari with Akabale, Akachari with Akabale, then the percentage is only 21%, corresponding to 32 out of 149 uh, lexical items that are attested in both languages. You'll notice that the, with the different pairs, the number of lexical items can be quite different. Uh, maximum, the maximum is I think 181 here for uh, Opuchiqua and Akabea. Uh, the minimum is the 58 here, I think, for Akachari and Akajeru. So there is that difference, but nonetheless, I think we have enough evidence. We have enough pairs, uh, so at least 58, we have enough pairs for each pair of languages that we can say something systematically about degrees of similarity. And just to make things a little bit clearer in this second version of exactly that same table, so these are exactly the same figures as in the previous table, but I have now highlighted those languages, actually those pairs of languages that have very high percentages. In fact, if we treat each of these three highlighted blocks as being a subgroup, within each subgroup, the range of similarities runs from 65% to 95%, so very high figures. On the other hand, if we compare two languages from different groups, then the percentages range 
from 15% to 40%. So there is a big gap from 40% to 65% between languages within the same group and languages in different groups. So what this enables us to do is to identify three subgroups on the basis of this material. So one is the North Andamanese languages, so the traditional languages, Akachari and Akajeru, plus present-day Great Andamanese. But into this group also very clearly falls Akakede. Middle Andamanese, percentages 84 to 94, so Okojuoi, Okol, and Okuchikwar. And finally, South Andamanese, only the two languages, sharing 80% of their lexicon on this, the basis of this material. So three very clear groups. Akakede, it's easier if we actually look here at percentages. So Akakede, clearly more close to North Andamanese languages, 78%. 81%, 65%, then to Middle Andamanese languages, 40%, 35%, 37%, and certainly South Andamanese languages, just 24% of similarities. So what this does is it enables us to resolve at least one of the outstanding questions that I mentioned, namely, which way does Akakede go? Does it group more closely with North Andamanese or with Middle Andamanese? The lexical material shows clearly that it goes with North Andamanese. Now, <clears throat> there is a convenient way in which we can represent those data. The table was one way, but uh, as the English proverb says, your picture is worth a thousand words. So we can also construct a diagram based on those figures, what is called a neighbor net representation. And here you have the neighbor net representation based on our lexical material. You see the North Andamanese languages here, Akachari, Akajeru, present-day Great Andamanese, all very close together, with Akakede just, <coughs> excuse me, just a short distance away. So that is one of the three groups recognized by this diagram. South Andamanese, Akabale and Akabe, the two languages very close to one another, but quite distant from the rest of the family. Middle Andamanese, Okojuoi, Okolopuchiqua, Okolandapuchiqua, very close together, um, but all three of them clearly forming a subgroup distinct from the rest of the family. So the main conclusions of that earlier work, there are three well-defined subgroups, Akakede groups with North Andamanese to give North Andamanese Akakede, so we see Akakede grouping with North Andamanese. There is no strong reason to group Middle Andamanese with either North Andamanese Akakede or South Andamanese. So this middle group here is roughly equidistant from each of the other two groups. In some ways, you can think of it even as being in the middle, not quite in the middle, but similar to occupying an intermediate position. We can also make a couple of more detailed conclusions. So within Middle Andamanese, uh, Opuchikwar and Okol grouped together against Okojuoi, whereas Manoharan had it the other way around, so Okojuoi and Okol grouping together against Opuchikwar. Let's now turn to the grammatical morphemes. <clears throat> We identified a total of 58 grammatical morphemes. Um, the number will probably uh, increase somewhat. This is work in progress. So it may be that the number will increase somewhat, but not uh, to any significant extent. So the grammatical morphemes with the number uh, in each category, it includes possessive prefixes. 
other inflectional affixes, uh, body part prefixes or somatic prefixes, other derivational affixes, the basis of personal pronouns, uh, an article, there's only a definite article, a number of postpositions, uh, one conjunction, and a rather large, somewhat mixed uh, number of particles. Now, there is one important difference looking at grammatical morphemes, actually two important differences, looking at grammatical morphemes in contrast to lexical morphemes. One is a danger. Grammatical morphemes are usually short, so the likelihood of chance similarity is greater. One simply has to bear this in mind. But the second, and maybe the more important point, is that the presence of a given grammatical morpheme in a given language is subject to more variation. The cultures in which traditionally the great Andamanese languages were spoken were very similar to one another. So you would assume that in terms of lexical items, they probably had the same or very nearly the same range of lexical items, even if the forms might have been completely different, the concepts that would have been named would have been very similar. And this would apply both to uh, physical objects like stone or sun, for instance, um, but also to more abstract concepts like good or big, for instance. However, grammatical structure uh, tied into uh, social structure or physical environment. So we find sometimes quite considerable variation so, for instance, North Andamanese has ergative absolutive alignment of case marking of full noun phrases with an overt absolutive morpheme, an enclitic. Akakede, Middle and South Andamanese have neutral <laughs> alignment and therefore necessarily <laughs> lack an absolutive morpheme. So here in present day Great Andamanese, the child cries, the single argument of the interest <coughs> verb has the absolutive suffix. Ram is eating a mango. The patient of the transitive verb has the absolutive suffix. Ram, the agent, does not have an absolutive suffix. By contrast, in Akabea, there is no case marking, no flagging for intransitive subjects or for transitive agents or for transitive patients. So there um, we simply have nothing to compare across the groups. We can compare the absolutive within North Andamanese, but we cannot compare it with anything in the other groups. Nonetheless, it is possible to proceed uh, a good way with the same kind of methodology as was illustrated before for lexical items. So here we have five examples. So the pronominal uh, possessive prefix, first person plural, which is an M across all present day great Andamanese varieties. So that's A all the way across. Uh, the locative I've already mentioned, we now know a little bit more about the uh, morphophonological vari variants. Uh, so there are more variants here than in the earlier table, but it's still the same pattern. North Andamanese Akakede has one set of forms, Middle Andamanese a second set, South Andamanese a third set. With the causative prefix, North Andamanese Akakede and Middle Andamanese go together, South Andamanese is different. By contrast, with the purposive morpheme, South Andamanese and Middle Andamanese go together, and North Andamanese is different, with even two different forms attested within North Andamanese, because the present day Great Andamanese form is different from the attested forms in the traditional languages. <clears throat> and sometimes all three groups, uh, sometimes we have a slightly different uh, three way grouping. So with the negative particle, Akakede normally goes with North Andamanese, but in this particular case, it goes with Middle Andamanese. 
So we can build up a chart of this kind for the 58 uh, grammatical categories. On that basis, we can draw up a chart, similar table, similar to the table I showed you before. So this shows the number of grammatical morpheme lookalikes among pairs of great Andamanese varieties. So here, the number of lookalikes out of the total number of possibilities, so the total number of morphemes that are shared by the two languages, and in the bottom left uh, half of the table, you have those figures expressed as a percentage. Again, I can show this somewhat more clearly by highlighting uh, three sets, the three groups which have the highest percentages, it's exactly the same as what we saw before. So even though we're now looking at different morphemes, grammatical morphemes rather than lexical morphemes, we still get this very similar pattern suggesting that this is a very robust uh, division into groups that we are uh, revealing here. So the ones that are highlighted in blue have higher percentages, so they actually range from 82%. They range from 82% to 100%. Akajero and PGA, present day great Andamanese, share all of the attested morphemes. And then if we go across groups, then we have smaller percentages, 41% to 71%. <clears throat> And again, we can show this by means of a neighbor net diagram. There are details, and some of the, the details in uh, the differences in the detail, and some of those differences are actually quite interesting. But the basic pattern is still the same three major groups North Andamanese, uh, PGA, and Akajero should, Akajero should actually be directly underneath PGA. They have exactly the same. Uh, they have 100% similarity, but uh, both very close to Akachari, somewhat less close to Akakede. So again, we see a North Andamanese group and Akakede very close to that, giving us a North Andamanese Akakede subgroup. The three Middle Andamanese languages, again, close to one another, again with Okol and Apuchiqua uh, grouping together as opposed to Okojuoi. The two South Andamanese languages, Akabale and Akabea, again very close to one another. And in terms of grammatical morphemes, if anything, even sort of further separated from the main, uh, from the bulk of the language family. So what are the main conclusions that we see here? There are again three well-defined subgroups. Akakede again groups with North Andamanese to give North Andamanese Akakede. In fact, it groups even more clearly so than in the case of lexical items, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Within Middle Andamanese, Opuchiqua and Okol again group together against Okojuoi. Present-day Great Andamanese and Akajeru, so the present-day language and the traditional language on which it is most closely based, are even closer in terms of grammatical morphemes with 100% similarity than in terms of lexical items with 95% similarity. Now, if this difference is robust, it needs to be tested statistically. If it is robust, it fits in very well with an observation by Anvita Abbey, who says present day great Andamanese draws its lexicon from, I'll use our names for the languages, so draws its lexicon from Akajeru, Akachari, Akakora, Akabo, so from all four uh, North Andamanese varieties, but is primarily based on the grammar of Akajeru. So if that's the case, then we would expect 100% or close to 100% similarity in grammatical morphemes, 
but the possibility of a lexical difference between the present day language and traditional Akajeru reflecting lexical items that have been taken in from other varieties of North Andamanese. Now, as to the relationship among the three groups, North Andamanese Akakede, Middle Andamanese, and South Andamanese. This diagram is rather puzzling. It shows Middle Andamanese and South, sorry, Middle Andamanese and North Andamanese closer to one another than either is to South Andamanese. That was the hypothesis that Manoharan uh, developed. Um, we had the opposite in our first publication on this, and then in our second publication decided there was no clear reason for grouping uh, any of these as more closely uh, as more close to anything else. But this diagram does suggest that Middle Andamanese and North Andamanese Akakere might actually be closer to one another. However, one has to bear two things in mind. One, it's important not to overinterpret such neighbor net diagrams. The program that produces them has to work its way through any conflicting data. It has to make decisions. It is forced to make one decision or another. It has to come up with a diagram. And by tweaking the uh, various parameters, where you get uh, possible uh, contradictions, as might be the case here, then you can actually get different representations from the same set of data by setting the program to emphasize different parameters. So it's important not to overemphasize that. And a second point, with the grammatical morphemes, in contrast to the lexical morphemes, there's a fair number of morphemes for which we cannot make comparison, sometimes because one uh, item is just not documented for a particular language, but sometimes because we know the language did not have that morpheme. So Akabea, for instance, did not have an absolutive morpheme. As far as we know, only Akachari, present-day Great Andamanese, and Akajeru had absolutive morphemes. So we don't have quite the same uh, degree of comparability for different grammatical morphemes as we had in the case of lexical items. So that diagram uh, suggests probably more than any specific uh, configuration, suggests rather that the relations among the three subgroups clearly require further investigation. The position of Akakede, we just come back to that. So remember, that was controversial grouping with Middle Andamanese, as Manoharan suggested, or with North Andamanese, as we suggested. Now, in terms of grammatical morphemes, Akakede is even closer to North Andamanese than in terms of lexical items. With lexical items, Akakede is located some distance from North Andamanese in the direction of the intersection of the three axes on the neighbor net diagram, though still clearly very close to North Andamanese. Now, this is consistent with the following scenario. Akakede was earlier very close to North Andamanese, and this is reflected in the more conservative grammatical morphemes. Contact with Middle Andamanese, and this is explicitly noted by Portman that there was a cultural contact between the Akakede and the Middle Andamanese, this has led to some lexical influence of Middle Andamanese on Akakede. On either the lexical or the grammatical criteria, <clears throat> Akakede groups with North Andamanese, but there has been more lexical influence from Middle Andamanese than there has been grammatical influence. When I compare this with the uh, position of English, a Germanic language and its grammatical structure, especially uh, its inflectional morphology, is very, which is very conservative. I mean, lots of things have been lost, 
but what has been retained is very conservative and is clearly Germanic. However, in the lexicon, English has taken in a lot of loan words from French, actually older periods of French, regional varieties of French, uh, so that if you look at the lexicon, then there would be a reasonable proportion, even in the basic lexicon, of words of Romance origin in English, even though there are no, or hardly any, uh, probably no inflectional um, morphemes, bound inflectional morphemes that are of Romance origin. So, what are our overall conclusions? So, our examination of grammatical morphemes by and large confirms the subgrouping based on our earlier analysis of lexical items, contradicting in some instances the earlier subgrouping proposed by Manoharan, which, as I already mentioned, seem to have, seems to have been based more on social and geographical than linguistic criteria. In particular, Akakede clearly groups with North Andamanese in a North Andamanese Akakede subgroup. While the three subgroups, North Andamanese Akakede, Middle Andamanese, South Andamanese, are clearly established, the relation among them remains elusive, as results are sometimes contradictory. We hope that further investigation will clarify the situation. So, of course, the material that is available to us is the material that is available to us. It's very unlikely that by chance some new material will be discovered. So, it may be that we are already pushing the limits of what can be done in terms of subgrouping the languages. So, what I have tried to do is not only suggest a possible subgrouping of the languages of the Great Andamanese family, something which has not previously really been done uh, on a solid linguistic basis. So that is an empirical result. But I hope also to have illustrated various methodological issues that arise in trying to carry out such a project, some of which can be resolved, but some of which remain difficult, maybe even impossible to resolve, given the limited amount of material at our disposal. So I would like to end by thanking my hosts for inviting me to give this lecture and to uh, congratulate them on the uh, Foundation Day of the Institute. And I would like to thank you, my audience, for your attention. Thank you, Professor Comrade, for a very, very illuminating and very informative talk on the great Andamanese languages from a historical linguistics perspective. As you rightly said, many people who have been working on these languages look into social and geographical uh, perspectives. It's the first time we are uh, hearing something about the subgrouping of these great Andamanese languages. I would like to just briefly summarize what Professor Comrie said and then open uh, the talk for discussion. As all of you have uh, been listening, he started with providing a fantastic overview of the linguistic work done on the traditional varieties of the Great Andamanis. Then he moved on to the subgrouping of languages, wherein he chose to address two unresolved issues. One was, how do you, where do you group the Akakede languages? Whether is it with the North Andamanis or with the Middle Andamanis? There were two ideas. This, the second issue he addressed was this middle Andamanese group with more with North Andamanese or with South Andamanese or with neither. He used the lexical basis for subgrouping for identification of lookalikes, generated the similarity indices within the subgroup and across the subgroup of these languages and identified three subgroups in a very, very systematic and beautiful manner. North Andamanese, he has identified four languages that can be easily grouped under North Andamanese, three under Middle Andamanese, and two under South Andamanese. For, for those two, he has grammars, and one grammar is already published, and another is coming up. So it's interesting, he has more grip over the South Andamanese languages from a linguist point of view, from all languages, not just the lexical basis, but also the grammatical, morphological 
diseases and morphosyntax as well. And his initial conclusion was that KD can go with the North Andamanese languages based on the lexical analysis. And he moved further to identify the subgroupings based on 58 uh, grammatical morphemes and highlighted that it is again with the lexical basis analysis with the same three major subgroups. And also he has a hunch that there could be chance similarity is more likely than the other. He further concludes that Akkade groups with North Andaman is even more clearly with the grammatical morpheme analysis and also identified that the present day greater Andamanese and Akajeru is closer in terms of grammatical morphemes than in terms of lexical items. Described many relations among these subgroups and provided with the conclusion that these subgroups need further investigation. It was a wonderful talk. Now the talk is open for discussion. May I ask a question? Uh, yes, Tetra. Please, please go ahead. Uh, uh, I was just uh, interested in terms of how do you deal with, or if there is, to begin with, the first question is, if, is there any smash discrepancies between the synchronic and the... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm losing uh, audio. I'm sorry, I cannot hear. Uh, Chaitra, I think I, I better... Chaitra, there is some audio disturbance. Can you put your question in the chat box as well? I can because it's not great. Yeah, please go on. If you can also put in the chat box and you can also speak here. Oh, sorry, good morning, sir. Hello? Hello, good morning, sir. Bapuji, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, it is a, a wonderful talk from the historical perspective, especially on subgrouping. Just I would like to know, uh, in one of these slides, you said that comparative method, method doesn't work here. Uh, may I know the reason, sir? OK, um, it's not that the comparative method doesn't work. The problem is we do not have enough data to uh, give input into the comparative method. Um, you know, the comparative method was initially developed with Indo-European languages. Indo-European is a very large language family with a number of different branches. Some of those branches are very uh, dense, so they have tens of languages. In case of Indo-Aryan, you know, well over 100 languages. Um, so there is lots of material to compare. And many of the languages are very well documented, very well described. In the case of the great Andamanese family, we have only, we think, probably six languages, but you know, at the most, 10 traditional and one modern variety. Um, the documentation is very sparse. We have, for instance, uh, virtually no texts for the traditional languages. Um, people gathered lexical items. Uh, they also constructed a kind of phrase book uh, with sentences, many dialogues, but virtually no natural text in any of the traditional varieties. So this means the amount of material is extremely limited, and we therefore just don't have enough material as input in order to work out, for instance, what are the uh, systematic, uh, regular phonetic correspondences across different languages or across different branches of the family. And the comparative method, of course, is a method of universal applicability if you have 
the relevant amount of data and if you have the relevant quality of data. Uh, here, quality of data is not really a problem. I mean, most of the, the documentation was uh, well done, a lot of phonetic detail missing, but the basic uh, outlines uh, clear enough. The problem is the uh, lack of data, so just not having enough data to uh, set the comparative method to work. Yes, and thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, I'm, I'm reading the question put forward by Chaitra Puttaswamy. Uh -huh. are, there any, are there any discrepancies between the synchronic and diachronic data of Great Andamanis? If there are discrepancies, how have you dealt with it? Okay, uh, in terms of discrepancies, um, and yes, there are discrepancies. Uh, in fact, but um, though overall the the material is you know very homogeneous, but certainly uh, if we we will occasionally find a difference between what Mann said and what uh, Portman said or what they wrote. Um, about the interpretation of a particular lexical item. So even within the traditional material, there will be occasional examples like that, but they're really very rare uh, given the amount of material that we have overall. <clears throat> Diachronic discrepancies, um, I suppose that could mean on the one hand, uh, where there are forms in present-day great andamanese or lexical items or uh, grammatical morphemes that don't seem to have any relation to anything in the traditional material. There are some examples of that. I actually showed one in, in one of the slides, so one of the grammatical morphemes where present-day great andamanese has a form different from akajeru and akachari, both of which have the same form, and different also from the Akakede, Middle Andamanese, South Andamanese forms. So in that sense, you occasionally we find forms in present day Great Andamanese that we cannot relate back to what was attested in the earlier stage. But I emphasize it's to what was attested in the earlier stage. It's always possible that something we find in present day Great Andamanese might go back, let's say, to a form that was found in Akabo or um, in Akakora, because as I said, the only attestation we have there are a few lexical, uh, few lexical items and toponyms. Uh, otherwise, um, of course, the comparison, if we're comparing the traditional languages to one another, we're comparing languages that were documented in the same period, we don't really have, for the traditional varieties, any diachronic dimension for individual languages. In particular, because Mann and Portman, the first two people who worked on the traditional languages, concentrated on the South, whereas Radcliffe Brown, the last uh, of the three, excuse me, the last of the three great documenters of the traditional varieties, concentrated on the north. So it could well be that changes had taken place in that half century uh, in the south or in the north, and we would not know about them. So I hope that uh, answers the intent of your question. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I just wanted to know how you, uh, what the decisions you went through in uh, deciding the difference between the two time zones that you were dealing with. Right. Um, yes, I mean, certainly the material is different with the present day great Andamanese. You know, we have documentation by an outstanding linguist, outstanding field worker. For the earlier period, uh, none of the three was a trained linguist. Radcliffe Brown, by his own admission, had taken a phonetics course, uh, but had not been very good at it and uh, sort of wished he'd taken another phonetics course. Uh, alas, that wasn't possible once he got to the field. Um, so yes, uh, there, there are discrepancies of those kinds. 
Um, they probably they probably come to the for more in looking at the syntax, which I have not really touched on except for the one example of uh, alignment differences in alignment typology. Uh, they would probably be more relevant in terms of uh, syntax uh, than in terms of morphology or lexicon, which tend to be more conservative. Uh, lexicon conservative even over um, a period of what, 100 and, I suppose 150 years, maybe the, the period that we're looking at. Uh, yes, uh, Vishwanandan, you have raised your hand. Vishwanandan Das? I can't hear you. Uh, I think you need to turn your microphone on. Sorry. I'm sorry, Professor Komi. Good morning to you, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had already discussion with some with regards to numeral, as you could remember. I just wanted to uh, this, uh, say something that uh, I noticed that you have noted and reviewed several works of many scholars those who have studied in great underminage in your presentation, mm -hmm. saying that no linguistic studies in this language were held in 20th, 20th century. Whatever has happened, those are only in 21st century. Like Professor Manohar and Professor Alvita B and Rahul Jokpani and you are together. However, you have not considered one seminal paper Jojendranath Basu, 1955, which was published in Indian Linguistics, Sunit Kumar Chatterjee volume, a general note on the Andamanese language, languages. Uh, it has discussed about uh, uh, discussed about uh, something like lexical and uh, uh, lexical things and prefixes, suffixes, and uh, all. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. Uh, uh, I think you have not gone through or you have not noticed that paper, sir. Um, in the course of a one-hour lecture, um, I had to limit myself to what was relevant to my topic. Um, there is, there, are, yeah, there are indeed a number of other uh, papers on languages of the Andaman Islands. I think uh, Raul and I probably have a complete collection. Uh, we have done our best to gather everything together. And what I was concentrating on today was the most extensive documentation. I did mention that there are other people, there were other people in the 19th century, and even uh, certainly in the 19th century, who did some documentation. There are other people who have worked on the languages, either uh, occasionally at first hand, uh, also using uh, secondary materials, as Raul and I have done, so using other people's materials. Yes, there is a lot of literature. If I had uh, mentioned all of that literature, let's say if I had read out the bibliography to our grammar of Akavea, that would have probably taken most of the time uh, of my lecture. So I concentrated on the things that are relevant to the points that I was making. Notice, okay, I will send you, notice, I will notice send you that in terms paper. of in terms of identification of lexical items, for instance, um, we have done uh, a certain amount of work comparing the different sources. But we acknowledge, we explicitly acknowledge in all of our work that the basic work of collecting the material, in many cases, the initial stages of the analysis. That was done by other scholars, including both those colonial scholars and Indian scholars. Um, so we uh, certainly acknowledge all of that work. Today, I mentioned those parts that are most directly relevant to the topics I was discussing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. That's fine. Uh, yeah. So, are there any other questions from the Google group? Because we do have questions from uh, YouTube. But first, we would take the questions from the audience from the Google Meet room. Any questions? Professor Sachdeva. We also have Professor Alec Koop and others.
I see a hand raised by Sri Kumar. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir, yeah, it was a wonderful lecture, sir. Thank you for that. I was just, uh, you know, uh, thinking probably the kind of mixed language that you have in Andaman. That is a, I think you called it as a modern day great Andaman. Is uh, that is somewhat uh, similar to Angami in the northeast. Uh, um, okay, I'm not um, familiar in detail with Angami. I have, of course, yeah. heard of it. Um, so I, I can't uh, say I can think uh, from the Great Andamanese side. But I, I think uh, your know, present day Great Andamanese, first of all, it's probable um, that the four traditional varieties were already very close to one another. I mean, we think they were probably dialects of a single language. Um, and certainly people like Radcliffe Brown claim that, for instance, a speaker of Akajero and a speaker of Akabo could you know, freely converse with one another. Um, so, you know, yes, there has been some <clears throat> mixing, some mm -hmm. homogenization in the development of great and present day great Andamanese, especially in its uh, lexicon, uh, less so in the grammar, which does seem to be based very squarely on Akajeru. Um, so if, if that is similar to the, the cases that you are familiar with, then uh, that would certainly be a, a point of comparison. And even if there are differences, that would also be a valid point of comparison to see what the differences and similarities might be. So for instance, if the languages that are coming together in or the varieties that are coming together in one part of the world are more different from each other, than the varieties of North Andamanese were, that might give rise to a different kind of situation. Is it a kind of link language, rather, sir? That's what I was interested in to know. Um, is, it, is it a kind of a lingua franca developed for uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, facilitating communication between people, you know, having difficulties well, with different dialects and so on? Yeah. I think that's hard to say, in part because of the you know the missing decades. Mm -hmm. We have present-day Great Andamanese, as documented mm -hmm. by Anvita mm -hmm. Abi, in the uh, so starting around 2000. Uh, we have the traditional documentation, um, most of which was done before 1910. Mm -hmm. um, the details of what happened between then are not well documented. I mean, some things may be documented, but they're certainly not well documented. Um, if <clears throat> the dialects or the, if the varieties of North Andamanese were mutually intelligible, then um, what we, we would probably be witnessing something more like dialect leveling than mm -hmm. the actual development of a lingua franca. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, any other questions from the Google group? Okay, thank you so much, sir, and Professor Sashdev. I really enjoyed your lecture very much, and I was thrilled with it, and especially the historical analysis that you thought you were getting into. I was looking at some of the data. I mean, I can't now recollect the slide in which there was these three forms, Li or Il in one, and M or something like that in the other. And there was a third group in which there was a Lem. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that may be the source of both the other two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, that, um, that was a, <laughs> seemed a, I mean, to be a conjecture that I, I, I thought of okay. making it that way. There are certainly some cases where, um, in, in one sense, I simplified a little bit in that I sort mm -hmm. of uh, spoke as if the things either look alike or they do not look alike. Um, sometimes what we are doing is rather assessing whether things look more alike or less alike. Um, I have my notes here. Maybe I can quickly find uh, the example in my notes. I don't need to uh, have the slide. But yes, the, the negative. So one of the negative markers mm -hmm. in North Andamanese is pu. In Middle Andamanese is forms like poye. Mm -hmm. In South Andamanese is yaba. Oh, the South Andamese is clearly completely different. Mm. 
The North and Middle Andamanese, okay, there's certainly some similarity. There's a poo bit at the beginning, but the yeah bit at the end is different. Mm. Um, we treated those as three different forms. Mm. But um, this is the point where, uh, as I said, sometimes identifying lookalikes is subjective. Mm. So someone else might have come along and said, oh, poo, well, yeah, those are similar. They're clearly distinct from Yaba, which is mm. completely different. Mm. So, yes, there are some examples like that. There are also some examples, like the one you mentioned, uh, mm. where one form seems to be kind of a combination of the oh, other yeah, they do. forms. Yes. Um, that might be its historical origin. Mm. Of course, we can pose such questions, but I'm not sure we will be able to answer them. So it's always going to be a question of how plausible does that account look because it's very unlikely, excuse me, <clears throat> it's very unlikely that we're ever going to get more data. I, of course, dream of this that maybe you know, one now, day. I remember in Tibetan Burman, I was uh, with some students that we were working, we had an example for the number one numeral. One language had po, po, puo, and the other had khat. And one wondered there was no connection till one found a language and it was Pokhat. And suddenly the two fell together and everything, uh -huh. they all, you know, uh, in, fell in place. Oh, oh, you know, there was, I mean, what looked completely apart, suddenly there was a connecting language in which both were there. So, so that was in my mind when I was making the other mm -hmm. uh, relationship or, or yeah. something, you know, having both the parts and then, then it has got split into two and, and one has got. It could happen, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, all kinds of data can say. Yeah. yeah. So I suppose one should say maybe more strictly what we were doing was not just identifying lookalikes, but also yeah. sort of making judgments. Uh, mm -hmm. Are the forms sufficiently different that it makes sense to establish different mm -hmm. groups? Mm -hmm. But of course, doing that without uh, taking into yeah. consideration. Oh, obviously, I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, wonderful listening and getting the data and you examining it. I hope that I don't know what is going to be the source. Whether we, we, uh, Uma, we may have some data on in the CIL on uh, Andamans with us. With, uh, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add those things at the end. Yes, we have some scholars who have been working on Andamanese languages for more than two, three decades, like Professor Nyan Sundram and uh, Professor Ranganatha, then Dr. Raja Singh. Dr. Raja Singh's dictionary is available on our uh, website. Uh, mm -hmm. I will send you the links. Mm -hmm. And Professor Yanyan uh, Sundaram Ranganatha and their team, they have also published uh, some works. Of course, since you already- well, Mostly in Nicobaris, I think some of them. Mostly in Nicobaris. But, uh, yeah, Nicobaris, but uh, not from a historical linguistics perspective, mm -hmm. but it would be, of course, we do have data which might uh, help uh, you to look into the, subgrouping from other uh, perspectives as well. We, I thought I would uh, tell you right. about that. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think I mean, most of the people who are working now on languages of the Andamans are working on Ongan languages, simply because those are the most yes. vital languages. Uh, you know, good number of speakers. That is true. Yes. So we do. Thank you. So we have one question, or rather a comment from uh, Sangyuta Ghosh on YouTube. She's curious to know the sources of the post positions in these languages and their functions. They have many prefixes already for performing grammatical functions, as you mentioned. So she's curious to know the sources of the post positions. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, some of the, um, we have looked at this in particular in Akabea. We actually have some discussion of this, I think, in our grammar of Akabea. Um, and you know, some of them do seem to be instances of grammaticalization of uh, what, what, would, what would originally have been separate lexical items. Um, so there do seem to be some instances of that. Of course, since we have so little um, time depth in looking at uh, an individual language, um, it means that uh, what we can do is we can sort of compare, oh, this postposition looks like this adverb, for instance. Um, but we don't actually have direct evidence 
that one is derived from the other, as one might, for instance, in an, uh, a well-documented Indo-European language or Chinese, where you have uh, centuries of uh, almost continuous uh, writing in the language and where you can actually see forms gradually being grammaticalized. They become shorter, uh, they become more attached, possible freedom of movement is limited and so on. Uh, that we cannot really observe in great Andamanese languages. All right, thank you. Any other questions? I have two questions from my side. So mm -hmm. uh, number one, what was the basis of for selection or identification of these 58 grammatical morphemes? Uh, like, um, a related question, how many of them were nominal and how many verbal? Uh, OK, the second question of my list here. Um, basically, these are the 58 grammatical morphemes that we found in the languages. Uh, or at least the ones that it is for which it is easiest to say um, what their function is. There are also a number of morphemes which are probably grammatical morphemes, but some, uh, yeah, probably grammatical morphemes, um, but whose function is less clear. Sometimes they only occur in a couple of words. Um, sometimes they seem to have maybe a core meaning which occurs in a couple of words, but then a number of other words uh where it's uh, unclear what they're doing there so the 58 were the ones that we felt we could clearly work with so in that sense it's a comprehensive list however of course then as i said it's not a comprehensive list because we omitted the ones that we find problematic but the, the ones we find problematic anyway not because of the uh, comparative work there's morphemes that uh, yeah. whose function is not entirely clear and which might not occur across a wide enough range of languages. Okay, so but one more question some, from myself. There are some in that list that we uh, that we hope to return to, maybe we'll be able to make something of. So as I said, this is work in progress. So maybe eventually that number of 58 will increase somewhat. Yeah, it would be wonderful to see it increases so that we get a very good morphological, uh, typological analysis of these languages, which would mm -hmm. help us uh, to conclude your subgroupings. And also, as a few, I'm just thinking uh, aloud, would it be interesting for us to look into the evolved features of Dryas, 17 features of word order? Because even though these are OV languages, the OV languages of Tibeto-Burman are certainly different from the OV languages spoken in Dravidian or Indo-Aryan. So mm -hmm. another curiosity, how these languages, these three subgroupings, like would you be able to conclude uh, more with re regard to the 17 features of Dryas for okay. these groupings? In terms, of yeah. in terms of constituent order, the great Andamanese languages are all very similar. Um, so they're all verb final. Um, possessors precede, uh, but adjectives follow. Um, they have postpositions. So they have you know, many head final properties, um, with the obvious exception that adjectives follow. Um, relative clauses, uh, we don't, you know, no, I think we have examples across enough languages. So relative clauses also follow the, the head noun. So it seems that uh, now the noun phrase, well, the noun phrase is mixed, possessor before, adjective and relative clause after, but postpositions and verb final. And the verb final seems quite strict. So that means we need to probably look for some differences in terms of syntax, like how these groups differ, because you have given some solid uh, on, uh, morph morphemes, grammatical morphemes. Mm -hmm. So if word order, the general word order features are not going to make any difference to these languages, there has to be something which makes the North 
and the manis group distinct or closer to middle and the manis are deviating from south and the manis in a very unique way it may not be all the 17 teachers what dr mm -hmm. has put forward but i'm sure there will be somewhere something which makes mm -hmm. some distinction Well, the alignment typology, which I mentioned, is one which divides North Andamanese from the rest, including Akakede. Okay. Um, but of course, such general typological features can also spread, as we know from many parts of the world, in India as a linguistic area, yeah, classic example. Um, so one has to be careful in using syntactic features to do a historical historically based subgrouping you might well out well end up with a valid subgrouping but one which has no basis in early history it may reflect present day contact present day intense contact among different groups that's interesting i mean of course we will still catch up again i do have other questions related to tense and aspect but since we are running out of time if, but if you have a moment you can answer that last question from my side because since okay. again speaking morphologically uh -huh. it, do 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 they have distinct clear distinctions in other words is tense grammatically marked in these languages uh, and are all they similar all the groupings okay How um Yes, they do have uh, tense uh, tense affixes, um, and at least some of the languages, the tense affixes seem to have been optional. So you could also, if it was, if the time reference was clear, you could also just leave them out. We have that well documented for Akabea, for instance. Um, but the tense systems are sort of some morphemes which are. Uh, if not in form then at least in function similar across the languages but there are also considerable differences so one of the areas where we actually found problems arising in terms of comparability was actually with the tense aspect mood system um the different languages seem to have different sets of oppositions um some of course are better documented than others so depending on the you know kind of documentation you have um it may not always be clear whether something is missing from the documentation by accident or because it actually did not exist in the language in question so these are areas where we feel that we have to tread very carefully um in most cases we do feel confident in saying no there's enough material including with portman's phrase book you have uh, comparative translations across uh, three or four languages four languages um so if you consistently have a morpheme in one language and zero in one of the other languages then that was probably a real difference between the languages but for the less well documented languages and in terms of syntax and morphology this would also include akajeru well documented lexically but less so grammatically i mean akajeru we have a number of question marks you know we the docu the documentation does not include a morpheme with that meaning but we cannot confidently say there was no morpheme with that meaning interesting thank you so much are if are there any more questions all right so i must now take this opportunity to thank you formally so it was wonderful to have you with us today professor kamri you enlightened us for two full hours now you are here with us from indian time 8:45 onwards and it was a very fantastic uh, talk and it stimulated a lot of discussions thank you so much on behalf of my institute and also on my own behalf i still uh, cannot forget you took only a few hours to reply our email to accept this invitation it was so nice because we had already asked you earlier in 2012 invited you to cil 
for the 10th aspect and modality conference somehow you could not make it so mm -hmm. uh, we have been trying to reach you and finally we could get you so thanks a lot for accepting our invitation and for being with us today thank you so much have a lovely okay. evening okay um, i would like to thank you um everyone especially those who asked questions who have given Raul and me many things to think about as we develop this project thank you thank you thank you so much thank you again i'll talk to you soon bye bye